What's he going to do? Why do you think Jesus is coming back? Only one reason. Yes, to take us to heaven. That would be a great day, won't it? And he wants us to think about that. He wants us to remember that because he came the first time and became our Savior and took away our sins, when he comes back, he's going to take us and take us to live with him forever in heaven. That's why we celebrate Advent. Pretty cool holiday, isn't it? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, what we can expect and what Jesus tells us before he comes back. So why don't we fold our hands and we'll thank him for this. Dear Jesus, we thank you for coming to this earth as a little child, for taking away our sin and promising us that you will come back to take us to be with you. Help us to, to think about that, to, to cherish that fact, to, to remember that our lives here are very, very short. Our lives with you in heaven will last forever. Yes, this in Jesus' name. All right, thank you guys for coming up. Can you go sit with your families? I'll thank you. We will continue by singing verses 3 and 4, four and 5. Right? <laughs> Too. 
Sometimes that can get lost as we look at the, the little things of this life and the flash of this life, and we forget that. But Jesus encourages us to remember because there's not that many days left for that either. In fact, there may be less days till that day than there is till Christmas. There may be more. We don't know. But Jesus tells us to be ready because that is the day for which we were created. I want to read you our sermon text again from Luke chapter 21 where we see Jesus' encouragement toward this day. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the surging waves, people fainting from fear and expectation of the things coming on the world. The powers of heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. He told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they are sprouting leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is actually near. So also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I tell you. This generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Watch yourselves, or else your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the worries of this life. And that day may come on you suddenly, for it will come like a trap on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Stay alert all the time, praying that you may be able to escape all these things that are going to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. This is God's Word. You know, Advent can be a confusing concept, and I, I don't want it to be, so I'm going to spend a little time talking about, about what it means. Advent, the beginning of the church year, is one in which we spend a lot of time talking about the end of time. But why is that? The beginning of the church year is where we start. It's where we look at Christ's first coming to this earth, the beginning of this new age. But the whole point of Christ's coming the first time was to prepare us for his final coming. And so the two are very intimately connected. Jesus talks about his return and how he desperately wants us to be ready for his return. And that's going to depend a great deal on how we see his first, his first coming. We talk about this New Testament period. We talk about the last age, the end times. And what we're talking about is this period between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. There's really two eras in all eternity. There is the in, in all earth. There is the first era and there is the second era. The first times and the last times. When we talk about the last times, the end times, we're talking about the time in which we live. This is the time that Jesus speaks of in these last days, he says. And so if somebody were to ask you, are we living in the end times? Sometimes that question is asked in a very cryptic way. Are you know, is is, is this month the last month of mankind? We are living in the end times. People have been living in the end times since Jesus rose from the dead. But we might be in the early stages of it. It may be a thousand years away. Or it may be tomorrow. But Jesus says be ready. <clears throat> be ready for his return. And how we're ready is how we view his first coming. Do we know who he is? Do we know that he is our Savior? Because if we do, and this is perhaps the most beautiful verse in this section, when he returns, you can lift up your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. The whole point of Jesus' encouragement, to be ready. Be ready for his return. Now, he does give signs. He says, there will be signs that will show you that I am coming. And in this New Testament area, in these last times, there are two sections. There are two different types of signs. I want to read this section to you again uh, from Luke chapter 21. He says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. But the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now this section kind of mashes together two separate sets of signs. There are signs that prepare us 
and there are signs that announce his coming. The, sounds that, the signs that announce his coming, when we see those, the world will be over. When he comes back, the world will be done. But the signs that he gives us to prepare us are signs that we're seeing already. When you look at what he says here, he says that there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexing at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Yet you could talk about how in the end God will roll back the heavens. He will basically uncreate creation. And yet we already see these things today. We already see signs today. And those become a little more clear when you go earlier on in Luke chapter 21. He talks about how there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilence in various places, and fearful events. Do we see those things? Of course we do, right? Somebody did some statistics for what it's worth. And in the history of our country, almost 90% of our history, there's war. It's hard to believe, but when you think about it, there's always some kind of conflict that our, our, our country is engaged in. If you talk about world history, there has not been a time since the beginning where there hasn't been conflict. There are wars, and there are rumors of wars. Great earthquakes? I won't say coincidentally, because God has a hand in everything, but as I was studying this text this week, there was a great earthquake in my hometown of Anchorage. Everybody's okay. There was a ton of damage. And people ask, why? Where does this come from? Why is this happening? <laughs> These are signs. Famines, and pestilence, and, and great, great and terrible wonders from heaven. We see them on a regular basis. And what do they tell us? Jesus says these are signs to prepare us. That he is returning. That this world is a temporary place. And they are intended to pick our heads up and quit looking around quit looking at this world and look to the world for which we were created. Because God wants us to focus on this, to live here, but to focus on this, to focus on his return and our eternity with him. Remember these things. You know, it's kind of curious how God talks about the signs of his second coming and what it will be like at his second coming compared to the signs and what it was like at his first coming. There's so many really neat similarities. There's some big differences, but some neat similarities as well. And there were a lot of signs for his first coming. You had the voice of the prophets talking about how there, the virgin will be with child and give birth to his son. Or in Micah, he will be born in Bethlehem in Judea. Those small among the clans of Judah, from one who would rise to one from, who was ancient from all times, the ancient of days. Voice of the prophets talking about the Lamb who would come and sacrifice himself for us. And then there were signs in the heavens. Prophet Daniel talked about how the, the countries of the world would progress. And in the time of the fourth country, which was Rome, the fourth empire, during its decline, a king would rise, who would reign forever. There were people who were watching. People who were looking and following the dates. People who saw another sign in the heaven. God used one of his created stars. Whether he created it at the beginning with the rest or whether he created it at that moment, we don't know and is irrelevant. And yet he spoke to these people, these people from the east, and told them that his king had come. God was giving them signs. Or the shepherds. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. What a shepherd was, right? A shepherd was one who watched sheep. And in Israel, sheep had a very specific purpose. Sheep were not just a food source. Sheep were used regularly in the sacrifices of the temple. I was told that during that time, there was a group of shepherds whose sole purpose was to raise sheep that would be used in the temple sacrifices. And I'm not going to go so far as to say this group of shepherds were that shepherds. But every shepherd understood the nature of the sheep. The sheep not only served as food, but as a sign of the Lamb of God who was going to come and be sacrificed to take away our guilt. These shepherds saw those signs every day. And when God came, when the angel came from heaven with the trumpets and the, and the glory and the singing, they embraced it. 
because they had been waiting. They had been watching the signs, and they knew what this meant. When they came and said, there is peace on earth because a Savior has been born to you, they accepted it. They, they embraced it, and they ran, and they saw him, and, and, and they, they rejoiced at, at who they were because of who this child would make them to be, the children of God. It's a beautiful thing. These people had been prepared for his first coming, and they rejoiced in it. But there were people who weren't. There were people who saw the same signs. And we're not ready to get Herod, King Herod. He saw the signs. He heard the signs. He was told the signs. He told us told exactly what it meant, but he was not ready. He was king, and he didn't want another king. And so when the king came, he rejected him. He even tried to kill him because he was good enough to be his own king. There were others. There was religious leaders who did not want a savior, did not want a messiah. They thought they could do it themselves. And so they rejected it. They saw the signs. Jesus even pointed it out. They read the scriptures, which talked about him. But they refused to hear the voice of the prophets. They refused to hear the voice of God. And then there were many who just ignored him, who just didn't want anything to do with him. Maybe not as drastic as trying to kill all the children of Bethlehem. But certainly as tragic. Because they were not prepared for the first coming of Christ, and they were not prepared for his second. Now, the beauty of God's love is that even if they weren't prepared that day, they had more days to come. There would be more Christmases. There would be more years. And we do read about people who had once supposed Jesus and then became his children, became his brothers. That's a beautiful thing. The second coming of Christ will be similar, but very, very different. There are signs. And we see those signs. Jesus says, look around and you see the troubles of this earth. Let this be a sign to you that the end is coming. Just like you would look at a fig tree. He says, if you look at a fig tree and you see, the, you see the leaves, you know how to read those things. And you know that spring is coming. And since you want spring to be coming, you're paying attention. And you see those things. And that's a wonderful thought. And we know how that is, right? I mean, it's just winter. It's hard to even talk about spring right now. And I love this. Don't get me wrong. You know this. Oh, Five months from now, when the grass starts growing and the birds start chirping, and we get the boat out, that's a good day. Jesus says, you see the signs for this too. You see the signs for my return. It's the pain of this earth. It's the, the tragedies that you see around you. It's my voice, which reminds you, I am coming back. Listen to these things. Be ready for these things, because not everybody does. He says it's very easy to get caught up in the anxieties of life and then to be consumed by the carousing and the drunkenness that, that sometimes we seek to, to alleviate. But the anxieties of life, we could spend all day trying to list those. But basically it comes down to this, looking at this life and, and thinking this is it. And that's not a great thought most of the time. This is it. This is as good as it gets. The problems that we have are, are going to last until the day I die, and that's it. And that can be depressing. How do you deal with it? Bury your head in the sand, you ignore it. Bury your head in your hobbies, your bottle, what Jesus is talking about. Doing whatever you can to just get by. He says, don't get caught up in the day to day because that's what's going to happen. Live this life, but look ahead to the next. Look ahead to what he's done for us. We look back, and we see God who became a human being. To pay our debt, to live a life that we should have lived, to do all the things that you and I should have done in our lives and didn't, to live a life that we would get the credit for, and then to pay our sin debt, to take the blame for all that we have done. We look back to what Christ has done and how he did it all for us, how we became our righteousness, and then we look ahead and know that because of these things, when we see these things, when we see the signs of his return, whether it's today, whether it's a thousand years from now, we look up. We lift up our heads because we know that his redemption is near. How many days? Tomorrow? Maybe. A thousand years from now? Who knows? Jesus says be ready. And we are ready, which is why we live our lives with joy. And by the power of God, by the power of his promises, may we always be ready and say with John in Revelation, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
Now may this peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Once again, please rise and turn to page 31 as we join in confessing together our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 